So I'll do some obligatory questions. How many here have heard the term distributed tracing? How many have heard it, def have, how many have heard it defined in one and only one consistent way? <laughs> so I will give you one way. It may not be consistent, but I'll add to your bouquet. Um, how about Zipkin? How many here have heard of Zipkin? Keep it up if you're running Zipkin. Oh, that's actually more than I thought. <laughs> cool. So I think I'm going to just say we have some clock drift and just call it 420. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we've got a half hour um, plus some time for questions. Uh, and this is an introduction um, to distributed tracing in Zipkin. And then um, directly following this, we'll get to dig deeper into uh, distributed tracing in uh, Spring through Spring Cloud Sleuth and uh, Reshmi and Marcin are gonna uh, be here. So if, um, if you got time, I think you should just keep on, keep on rolling. But we'll go he here on this, this material for you know, uh, about a half hour and then make sure you have time to you know, grill me if you want to. Um, so I'm Adrian, and today I got an email. It said that I had been working at Pivotal for one year. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, spring, spring Cloud team. And uh, I've been um, focused on distributed tracing, particularly Zipkin, Zipkin project, which I'll get into later. Um, I worked on that at Twitter and um, sort of helped open that um, more than, than we had before. Um, so it's a, it's a blooming community of sorts. Um, but this isn't so much about like the community work, it's more about the, the problem space. So uh, first thing I'll go into is latency analysis, which is what people think they're using distributed tracing for. Um, I'll get into why I make that a semi-question after a while. So um, latency analysis is like, you know, under, under the premise that latency is a product problem, like if you have increasing latency that users are aware of, they're you know, less likely to continue to use your service. Um, uh, analysis of, of why something took too long uh, becomes an important trick to have uh, you know, in, your, in your toolbox. The, uh, the work that I'm describing um, came out of um, two, two works of interest. Uh, one was a Google Dapper paper, which described how Google um, you know, did this sort of stuff in, internally, and also um, uh, you know, hunting those fail whales at Twitter. So back when it used to be, you know, we'd always see the fail whale when using the Twitter ap application. A lot of that was latency-related failures. And, you know, using latency analysis was how Twitter could get a hold of the, pro the problem. And then, you know, nowadays, we're much more likely to see ads and we will be seeing fail whales. Uh, back to the point, latency analysis is um, where, uh, where we're trying to break down the, the problem of our critical path and try to understand what's delaying it. And it could be, you know, a, a typical, um, like a REST request that fans out into various things or it could be um, messaging. But essentially you're trying to understand the latency that, that's impacting um, your users. And the, one of the important parts is, is that we're, we're very interested in our current architecture. Um, the tools and stuff that I'll be talking about today is, is not about like historical analysis so much. It's about like troubleshooting, you know, understanding uh, what's happening in your environment right now. Um, so um, having this in production is important. Um, of course, you can use these tools in lower environments, but, but it's primarily targeted at uh, things that would actually be always running in your apps. So um, I use this type of uh, role playing to talk about you know, the act of latency analysis without tools. Um, so if you, for example, use the most simplest form, like I try to post something and it takes a long time. And so um, I'm hoping some of this won't be too surprising, maybe boring for you, um, but we'll just try to like make it at least somewhat interesting. So the first thing I think about um, when trying to understand latency is like, what am I talking about? How long did it take? Like what is, what is long? So if, it, if it's post and, and I have no other tools except for like a console, I might just look at you know, a log statement that has 
like the same endpoint and and what's the distance between that and that that's my latency that's the duration of that particular request and so in this case I'm looking at server logs and maybe I've confused myself because it's GMT and you know my time zone might be different but eventually I sort it out and I, and I figure out that you know this is in fact the event that I, that was problematic and this is how long it was you know and I'm just taking notes basically uh, trying to find where in my network did this happen um, like as hosts matter uh, maybe you can get a client address maybe you can get a server address but jotting down these sorts of information give you the context that would differentiate this between all the other um, you know the other two requests in your system um, and then more specific than that like of all the requests coming from these sources um, which uh, event was it um, sometimes we have like, for example, if you're running in, in Cloud Foundry, you have a, like a VCAP request ID, like, or in other environments, you may have your own types of request IDs that um, users might be aware of. And so you can kind of jot that down because that could help in support and triage and, and maybe looking in other logs. But something we should have done before we even like started jotting down all this is try to understand, is this actually abnormal or not? So long is relative. Um, Definitely in tracing is relative. Uh, somebody might say 10 milliseconds is long. Somebody might say it's like very short. Um, but what, it, what is this? Is it, is it abnormal? Um, and usually we're comparing against historical information or, or some preconceived knowledge. Um, usually if, if I would be on call, I would, I, would, I would only be really paying attention if I got an alarm. And, and someone set up that alarm and they might have said the threshold is one second for this response time, and that's why you ended up in logs in the first place. But um, you know, just, just the length um, doesn't necessarily say it's wrong, it, uh, but it could, you could be able to find that it's abnormal. Um, in this uh, forged example, you, know, you can get to a point in you know, an aha moment, like where you have understanding of why, why it's delayed. And in this case, like maybe I found you know, a feature flag in the URL, uh, which, which had enabled something. In this case, like I'm making up that it was HD and it was just a linear relationship to the network time that was longer because of the higher definition file that I'm uploading. And obviously, it's not usually that simple, but um, understanding could be that like you're, you're, yeah, it took a long time, but that's actually okay for X and Y reason. And when you have an explanation, you've actually completed this like metadata you've collected and you, you, have, you have everything you need to do um, to either adjust your alerts or explain the scenario um, or whatever you, you were investigating in the first place. But I would say that this is like, not only is this a simplified um, example and like with a very quick, you know, five minute happy ending, um, but also it's, it's very simplified in, in uh, respect to a server is like, is meaningless without a client. So there's at least another side of the story. Um, so what is the actual user's perception? So those who work in mobile networks would, would understand that it doesn't matter like how fast your server is if your clients are on crappy networks and, and the cache isn't working that well. Like maybe their whole experience is very poor. And so it doesn't really matter if your localized um, you know, latency was, was low if the overall client uh, feels that it sucks. And so um, when we get into um, latency analysis, you know, the more information you have, the better. The closer you are to actual value, the better. And um, even in the simplest example of client-server, which isn't realistic, you, still, you still would want to um, consider um, as many sides of that as you can. And when we break it down, like say, say let's pretend that this was a real request. And we have this like two and a half seconds one side and one and a half seconds on, on the other side. Um, how would we know if this is okay or not? Well, we, we would break it down. Um, we, would, we would find out that certain things might be on the critical path and certain things are not. So in, in my forged example, um, someone already did some optimization, like they, they did some async storage, so got, you know, got the storage off the critical path and maybe just reading in some codec stuff that, that might have had to, to happen on the critical path. And this, these bars are, are, you know, again, these are all about time going by. But we do see something here that might be troubling, which is that the client tried to send the data on the wire twice. And so maybe they actually had a flaky network connection. And so that redundant um, 
you know, a wire send command uh, extended their, um, their overall time. And so if you're able to break down this, this you know, overall request into its parts, it's easier to see things that might be redundant. And those things that are redundant are the things that you can, you can actually take action on. And so when you, when you break things down um, into like that just right granularity, then, um, then you have a chance of, of making some quick wins. Um, and it's not that easy because not all things going on in the system are relevant. If anybody's ever looked at a Java stack you know, a thread dump, then you'll see all sorts of crazy stuff, especially if you have async handler function Q you know, receiver. And so um, when, when you're trying to uh, get a whole picture, it's as important what you filter out as, as what you actually um, you know, filter in. And so in this case, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's trickier than it looks. And like I alluded to earlier, like service architecture isn't really as simple as client server. We know that. We have all these talks about breaking down monoliths, and even our monoliths don't look like this. I mean, you could, if someone says monolith, they're probably still at least talking about there's a database server or there's, there's, there's other parts there. And um, I, mean, I mean, and we're pretty lazy. Uh, you know, we may want to have abstractions that, that um, simplify things for us, but if we're, if we're looking at trying to understand latency, we want to get down um, you know, to figure out if it's a SQL call uh, at the end of the day, um, even, if my, even if my server has little to say about that. Uh, it would help us explain and triage problems. And when I say lazy, I actually mean really lazy. Like, I couldn't even draw that myself. I just ripped it off of Wikipedia. <laughs> Um, I think our architectures are increasingly looking like this. Like this is from Spygo. Um, you know these. You know uh, at least sharded configurations where you're running like multiple instances and and you know maybe uh, different tiers um, doing different things like a, a routing layer and uh, you know maybe all these things are um, you know talking to each other uh, via things looked up from discovery service and maybe they're using um, you know clustered data sources like Cassandra and. Uh, the truth is right now, like we can say things like you should break up the monolith because it's, we can take action on that. It's, it's, much easy, it's much easier to deploy complex architecture than it has ever been, and that should hopefully continue in the future. So um, you know, the, the barrier to entry to creating like arbitrarily complex things is very low. And so um, I would say that one of the things we have to, to keep in mind is that our tools have to continue to get better. And so if we can create these, like, you know, now we're not just talking about microservices, we're talking about functional architectures with, like, functions as a, as a service, um, that uh, explaining, our late, explaining the, the dynamics of latency can become um, much more interesting and, and fine-grained than they were before from a service perspective. Service, and I'm using service as something crossing the network to, to perform the same overall operation. And most importantly, I say we, we, you shouldn't need wizards to troubleshoot them. Like, the path to troubleshooting shouldn't be like reliant on hiring someone from Netflix or, or whoever the author, author was. And so our challenge, in, like in this, in this uh, technology area, is to see about how can we lower the barrier, not just to deploy things, but actually to keep them running and operating and understandable. So that's that's where I think uh, distributed tracing kind of comes in. Because distributed tracing, like many things, is, is really, I think, an effort to commoditize knowledge. Um, you know, it's, it's collecting these things uh, end to end, so each person doesn't have to be like expert on Nginx, an expert on Spring Boot, an expert on you know, wh whatever things that may happen to be contributing to your, your system to understand the system as a whole. Um, and uh, that it also would allow us to get in touch with, with the history of, of our service so we can understand why certain requests that look the same might take longer than others. And in the vocabulary, there's lots of ways of saying the same thing, but the most common things that come up are this idea of a span and a trace. Um, and so I'll use those. Um, basically, a span is, is like a batch of, of information um, about an operation. So like it would include timestamps and, and certain events that happened or that might have um, key value pairs that like um, dimensions you might do lookups on. And a trace is a collection of, of these things in context of an operation. So for example, if you have one operation that comes in and fans out to five requests, then you would have 
six spans there because you'd have the root and then you have the five children and then if that called it you know it would be deeper but it would it would actually um, represent a call as it goes across the network and another way of looking at it here is is that we take those like simplified things that I was jotting down on my notepad about this post and translating them into things that might and might literally be fields in a distributed tracing system. Like you, you have the overall operation, um, you know, and maybe some boundary events, like this is a server operation, uh, or tags that say it's a server, or, or, or any other heuristics. And um, you know, with these descriptive information that can help you so that if you came across this, you'd have enough information to either understand or to point other tools to, to dig deeper into the problem. And there's one, many ways of discussing tracing, and it doesn't, I don't really think it matters whether you're doing it via agent or via explicit things, but really you're just, you're, you're tracking the important events, like the things that are actually going to help you understand your application or the latency of it. And um, these, these could be those things that I was drawing on the graph earlier, like wire send events, or like this is, you know, this is the sender or the receiver of a post. And um, while they are implemented differently, everything has to be placed in time because time is very important to us. With, you know, it's very hard to understand operations without understanding time. Um, and then, you know, imp importantly, the duration and some context. Like this came from this host and not that host. Uh, in Dapper-like systems, uh, like like Zipkin, which I'll explain later, and in a lot of them, they. Uh, they, ha they handle uh, the mechanics by doing two things. One is, is that they keep the structure of the call graph um, uh, with, with identifiers, like a trace ID, which might be in a header. And as your, as your application makes requests, um, it will add these things, like if it was an HTTP, uh, as header values to say that this is a trace you're in and this is where you are in this tree. And I'm using like stars and circles and things to, to represent identifiers that would be passed along, you know, in band in your production traffic as this call goes across the network and, and maybe it fans off into to different requests. And this is like the cheapest information that you can pass to allow the other side to know where it is in this trace. And then all the other stuff, like this was a SQL query and this is this the actual prepared statement and or, or this is a Histrix command, and this was like the Histrix uh, group that was associated with. All the details would just be schlepped to the tracing system as it can. So out of band, not in, in the line of fire for your production app. And that way, with a system like this where, where it can do you know, this sort of two-way, um, it can be safe to run in, in production without uh, risking, it, ri risking uh, the tracing system actually causing problems. And so it's kind of an interesting design point that a lot of these systems share, but not, not all of them do it the same way. A lot of them that are related to the Dapper paper do. So <clears throat> I, I mentioned some of this stuff. I mean, w one of the things that's uh, interesting about, about tracing is that it is collecting information. Not all of them um, are safe to, to uh, sample like for every single request. I remember, I think last year I, I visited Netflix and we're talking about like the amount of detail that they wanted on their system if they ran it it would be a larger system than Netflix's system to serve movies um, so like volume is is an important concern and so some systems will um, actually create a trace for every single request that it goes through the system some of them will do sampling which means that like maybe they do one one out of a hundred or one out of seven million or depending on on how many that you get because um, sometimes systematic problems you don't you can uh, use summary data to understand and you don't actually need to to um, uh, look at every single request and they're often opinionated so either in a library or an agent there's something that's making decisions about what to actually record and so that's the thing that's done on your behalf and that's why you wouldn't have to know all of the technology yourself they fill this space called observability, or some people call it visibility, or monitoring, or you know, whatever. Like, there's at least ten ways I'm sure people call their their um, team that does metrics and things. But um, uh, I, you know, at Twitter it was called observability, and um, the systems will do things, including 
um, grouping these together so that, say, uh, you're tracing a system and it's crossing five applications. Well, you're getting at least five pieces of information about a trace. So something has to collect them together. Um, so the tracing system would do that. Um, they might also do like fancy diagrams and, uh, to show your network architecture or to give you, um, you know, annotated views about, about the traces. One thing I found interesting is that the um, tracing systems, at least the ones that I've been more familiar with, do not have like unlimited retention. So, um, for example, Uber system has a two-day retention. So they, they treat it purely as, as a um, diagnostic tool, um, not as something like, you know, I'm going to look at my trace data from last week, because there is no trace data for last week. There's only trace data from two days ago. They only store summary data um, afterwards. And um, I would say tracing isn't just for latency. And in fact, a lot of people are using it because there's neat things you can do when you, when you can see the structure of how your requests go across the network. One is you can understand your architecture, not how you think it is, but how it actually is. So the, when people start using tracing systems, one of the first things that they get, the cheap wins, is that like, oh my gosh, that thing's accidentally causing, calling that? OK, let me stop that. Or, oh, it's doing it twice, or, or all these other accidents. And so um, when, I, when I talk, I, I think I've probably talked to at least a, a few dozen companies that, that work on various tracing systems. Um, the, the things that are, are most surprising are where they're finding that they're calling something they didn't think they should be calling. And, and tracing is one of those tools that you can use to understand that, even though it wasn't necessarily built for it. Um, and uh, like from a troubleshooting perspective, it's, it's another tool that you can use to reduce your triage time. So if you're not having to like, you know, understand a lot of things, you've got a, you, know, you have one trace that tells you all the information about things that, that went across the app, which ones were airing at the time. Um, you know, ideally, that's going to reduce your um, time spent troubleshooting by quite a bit. Your mileage may vary depending on what you have to work with, but these are very common things that come up. So um, I'm going to go into Zipkin now. Um, and, uh, but I'll tell you what, any questions in general? I've got some minutes I can use them here or later. So if, if I've completely confused anything, now's the time. One, go. Does it have to be about distributed? Can it not be uh, you know, application time taken? Uh, yeah. The question is, um, does distributed ha tracing have to be used for distributed systems? Um, can you use it also to help understand the processing that's going on in your app uh, that didn't leave the network? And so it's an interesting thing in, in, the, in the tool I'm going to talk about uh, now. Uh, we found in the last year people are using it much more often for local uh, understanding local commands um, than they have been in the past. And, and particularly the presentation after this, Spring Cloud Sleuth, um, does a lot of good work to name like your, you know, latency that's coming from certain components in your app. So not just focused on the service boundaries, but also some uh, summary um, spans about things going on inside the app. But I would differentiate it from a profiler. Usually you're not going to get a stack trace view, although some commercial products offer that. OK, so Zipkin sort of looks like this. Um, this is actually a screen screenshot from Uber. Um, and uh, so it has a latency view on the top. And then it breaks down the critical path based on operations. I'm, s I'm really surprised at how good this projector is, because usually this is completely unreadable. Um, but you probably can't read it all. Uh, the main thing is, is you've got a client uh, who's invoking an HTTP request. It tells you like what they've decided the service name is for the server side, in this case, Flask server, um, which is Python. And then how it breaks down into um, you know, SQL connections. And so it, this, is, this is an example of, of uh, you know, Zipkin in practice. So Zipkin's a, a tracing system. Uh, there's a number of, of um, libraries that can be used, not just what we'll talk about afterwards with uh, Sleuth. But um, you know, Ruby libraries, C sharp libraries, things like that, so that you don't have to have a homogeneous network in order to use tracing. I, actually, you shouldn't. Uh, it's a service level abstraction. Um, Zipkin has pluggable architecture, so um, the tracers are the things that live in your app, um, and they can report data to Zipkin over um, HTTP or Kafka, 
or, or if you're using Spring Cloud Sleuth, um, any Spring Cloud Stream, um, like uh, Rabbit, for example. Um, and then the servers uh, have, have basically the receiving side. So they'll either be you know, uh, accepting HTTP messages or, or Kafka messages or, or what have you, and then um, store these into a database, unsurprising choices, MySQL, Cassandra, Elasticsearch, and then um, you know, users would use that UI, or they could use um, you know, the API directly. Like we have a, an open API, AKA Swagger spec for the API that some people are making custom implementations with. Um, and the architecture pluggability sort of looks like this. Um, this is uh, literally a Docker Compose file, if you're familiar with that syntax. So um, we have some pretty easy to understand, I hope, environment variables like storage type um, that would help you understand how you're plumbing things together. So if you're doing starter stuff, you, pro you might, maybe you're not a Cassandra expert, maybe you want to use MySQL, so you just like change to the MySQL backend. And similarly, if you're using it as a, um, Zipkin's a Spring Boot server, um, so you can just you know, use the um, auto-configured dependency for, uh, for MySQL there. Um, and, and I think that if you're getting started with distributed tracing, even if like, you look at you know, your end game and, and you might feel like, oh, I'm gonna do 12,000 things per second, and um, always just start with simple. Um, and I'll, I'll repeat that later. The main idea is that um, zip, not just Zipkin, but distributed tracing in this way might be new, and so um, you know, ease your way into it. There's, there's lots of different folks that are working in things, and, and there's, there's advanced patterns available later, but um, if you're just getting started, probably just use MySQL um, or something like that that's easy to understand. Um, even easier, you can just download the file in Java minus jar it. It's a Spring Boot 1.4 app, um, and it has a built-in in-memory data store, which you should never use in production. Um, but it means you can Java minus jar and point it right now if you want to. <laughs> um, it lives in GitHub, uh, and uh, it was created in 2012, so it's like, gosh, four years old. Um, but um, we, we did a lot of maintenance in the last year, including porting it to, to Spring Boot. So it, it has some, some shine on it, and you might be interested in the code side if you are, um, definitely hop onto the org. Um, I, I have time, I'm gonna do it, darn it. I'm gonna do a quick boot demo, and let's see how fast this can work. So I would say the word Spring Cloud Sleuth. You're gonna get a, a, at least an hour of this afterwards and, and some more depth here, but let's see what you can do. So first thing I'm gonna do is see if I can do mirroring within four minutes. <laughs> All right, display, arrange, mirror, please. Okay, all right, win number one. Okay, so um, assuming a lot of people here are familiar with Spring and Spring Boot, is that the case? I know it's, a, I know it's not everybody because this is also Cloud Foundry. Um, uh, in, in Spring Apps, uh, you have things like Spring MVC, and this is where uh, you, you, know, you can do things to, like say I wanna map the path slash API uh, and then it would just you know, map that to a, a web route. So I have a backend here, and I'm gonna say, like I just wanna print out the date, and I wanna name my, my application backend. And on the front end, um, I will say route slash to an outbound call to my backend. And of course, I'm just hard coding things here. But I've named one thing front end, one thing back end, right? So I'd expect that I would be able to do a trace where those things are connected together. And because one thing I can't guarantee to just happen in three minutes is downloading anything, uh, I'm just gonna Java minus jar. Um, minus jar. Java minus jar. Thank you. Man, my, this projector is doing awesome. I can't even read it, but you can. Uh, <laughs> so here we have, uh, now I didn't put any Zipkin icon, because actually our icon doesn't render that well. But um, we've got Spring Boot running. Uh, I've got a, a Zipkin server now, and I'm gonna start up these two things. So, uh, what was that, back end, just did? Yeah, back end, and then front end. I'll have that started. And so I'm, I'm using a REST template in, in Spring World, uh, which is a normal way to make outbound calls. And I'm just using Spring Cloud Sleuth, which will, you know, this is the teaser for the next session. And 
I'll do like my most, um, th this is the best web experience that I've ever created. Um, and it includes, you know, text that increases with time. <laughs> so I, I've made three requests and um, I'm ju I just told, I told Spring to like keep every one of them. So I'll go to Zipkin now. And here I have Zipkin, it already knows that I have a backend um, because it all, it's already collected all this information. I have backend and frontend. Say I wanna find something. Um, I found that there are um, seven traces uh, that went through the backend. And the longest, which is ordered first, took 217 milliseconds. Um, but the shortest took eight. Now, who knows why that might happen? Why would you have a slow request? Anyone? Warming up the JVM, right? So, so this is a great way where you can actually show the actual effects of JVM warm up, like because you actually have a trace from the first request. And so, for example, if somebody said, "Oh, my request was really slow," you would see that there were six others, and it, you know, the other ones didn't take as long. Maybe you were the first request. Maybe it was GC. Who knows? Um, but then this breaks down into, you know, a call graph where. Um, I have the front end calling the back end and printing the date. And um, so this, this here, a call back end and print date, is, is the, the joy of the spring in instrumentation where it makes some nice decisions for you and uh, you're able to um, you know, understand those apps. So back. Um, we're out of time. I think there's 10 minutes. Is that true that we have 10 minutes for questions? Okay, well, we don't have 10 minutes for questions. Ah, okay, fatal mistake in my, okay. You can read me poorly on that part. Um, <laughs> got it. So um, wrapping up, uh, if you remember nothing else, um, don't start too fancy, just start. Uh, it's important to do it that order. Um, there's, there's Gitter, which is uh, a, uh, like a Slack or HipChat type of thing for open source projects that are on GitHub. We have channels for both that, uh, Zipkin and also Spring Cloud Studio, which is, which is the next session which we're transitioning into now. Um, so I appreciate you coming out and uh, hearing about uh, this tracing in Zipkin. And if you want to hear more, just keep your seat. <laughs>